السلام عليكم ورحمة الله نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولنا محمد طب القلوب ودواعيها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وذيائها على آله وصحبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله Today is the Majid. <coughs> Today is the 18th of Ramadan. Ah, Bajan. Bajan. So, so, of course, you know, as we mentioned before, Fasting, the obligation of fasting occurred in the second year of Hijri. So that's when those initial verses were revealed and fasting was made an obligation. It's the same year that the Battle of Badr took place. So the first battle took place in the first month of Ramadan. That was an obligation on the 17th of Ramadan. And we're going to come back to this point. One year after the obligation, so in the third year of Hijri, on the 15th of Ramadan, is the birth of Imam Hassan Mujtaba. Uh, and, you know, his position, you know, you know if you look at the Khulfah Rashidin, uh, most people, when we think of Khulfah Rashidin, we remember Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, radiallahu anhum. But, most of us, unfortunately, forget Imam Hassan. You know, the Khilafah Rashida is not complete without him. You know, Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, he said that the Khilafah will be for thirty years. And so, when we look at you know, the Khilaf of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, radiyallahu you have 29 and a half years. So, you know, and when Rasulullah said things, and you look back at them, you know, the beauty of, of how precise things were, you know, becomes more and more apparent. So those last six months were completed, by Imam Hassan <laughs> He is unique among the five though in many aspects and one of those aspects is according to uh, Ibn Hajar Makki Rahmatullah also known as Ibn Hajar Haythami Rahmatullah he says that the Khilafah of Imam Hassan is the only Khilafah that is directly proven through the Sunnah through the sayings of Rasulullah you know, if you look at the khilafah of the rest of them, you know, you can make broad interpretations and say, okay, yeah, this is what it means, but there's nothing direct or concrete. There's implied. Uh, and so when we look at Imam Hassan al-Islam, you know, when he came into the masjid and Rasulullah leaves the khutbah and picks him up and places him beside himself, and then he looks at him, and then he looks at the audience, and he looks at him, and he looks at the audience, and he says to them that this son of mine, he is the master of men. He is the leader of men. Because of whom, 
true lar two large parties will reconcile. And so Ibn Hajar Maki he says, this is the direct proof of the Khilafah of Imam Hassan. And his Khilafah is something that was undisputed at his time. All of those who agreed to the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali Radham, who were still alive at that time of Imam Hassan, also agreed to the Khilafah of Imam Hassan. Uh, and then, you know, it's also very interesting, you know, when he would, and, you know, we know the stories, you know, where Rasulullah Sallallahu would be making Salat and Imam Hassan al would climb on his back. And the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi would not get up from Sajda until Imam Hassan al himself left. Hmm. You know, and there are two main incidents, one this and the other one time, you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu is holding him and Imam Hassan al is is tugging on the beard of the Rasulullah. And the Rasulullah says, of course, draws him close and kisses him. And his mother, who of course is the leader of the women of Jannah, the daughter of Rasulullah, Bibi Fatima Salam Alayha, when she saw this, she said, you know, she tried to stop him. And the Rasulullah said to her, he said, do not interfere in the issue, in the, in the matters between me and this son of mine. Yeah. Which also tells us that this wasn't simple play. There's so much that's being passed on here. When the six months were up, Imam Hassan al-Islam, he hands over the rule. For two reasons. One is to avoid the bloodshed of the Muslims. And this also makes him unique among leaders. I mean, you know, you look throughout history. Who has given up the rule simply because he wants to save the lives of a few Muslims? I mean, you look at rulers even today and even a hundred years ago or, or a thousand years ago, they had no hesitation in sacrificing the lives of hundreds of thousands of believers simply to extend their seat for another day. Of course, it's more pronounced today, but, they, you know, you look at history, it's just the way it is. You know, when, when you take that seat, you don't want to let go. So people, you know, these leaders, I mean, they had no hesitation in, in having people slaughtered so that they could stay on the seat. And yet when we look at Imam Hassan al-Salam, you know, he hands over rule from a position of dominance. You know, it's one thing, okay, yeah, you know, the, the rule was forced away from him. That can happen to anybody. But when he handed over the rule, his army was in such a position that they would have annihilated the opposing army. But to save the lives of the believers, because he knew that in that army are also believers, he said, fine, nice stop. The rule is yours. And for those who think that Imam Hassan al-Islam gave bayah to Mavia, you know, their, their thought processes are reversed. You know, if you look at exactly what happens, what happened? You know, when Mavia realized that, oh, you know, we're going to lose, and if we fight, most of our army will be annihilated. So he sends two people from Quraysh to Imam Hassan al-Islam. Saying, saying that he's willing to do anything to agree to any terms so long as he is appointed as the ruler. So Imam Hassan al-Islam laid down five criteria or five demands. One was, he said that when you rule, you will rule according to the Quran and the Sunnah. And Mahavi al said, I agree. He said that this cursing of Ali, 
radio from the member has to stop. Mahavira Radio said, Well, I can only speak for myself. And Imam Hussain Islam said, Fine. None of the Shia, or none of those who have been loyal, here Shia doesn't mean Shia like today. Shia means party, the group. So those who supported Ali Radin were known as Shia Ali. Those who were in the army of Mawiyah Radin were known as Shia and Mawiyah. It just means party. So as none of those who are the supporters of Ali and myself, there will be no repercussions for them. You know, usually when a new ruler comes, what does he do? He's got to deal with those who opposed him. He said, no repercussions for them. Mawiyah Radin said, I agree. He says, we, the Ahlul Bayt, are not subjects of your governors and rulers. They can request us of things, but they cannot demand anything from us. Malvi Arana said, I agree. And then the last was that you will not appoint anybody after you. And again, he agreed. Of course, we know Imam Hassan al-Islam was martyred through poisoning in the 10 years after this, the year 50 Hijri. And then certain many things changed. But the, this was what was going on then. But the other aspect of why he handed over the rule is because he understood when Rasulullah Sussam said that the Khilafah will be for 30 years, and then will come a cruel monarchy. So he had no intention of ruling for even a day after that point. That he did not want to be associated with anything that is not directly in line with, with the way of his grandfather. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so in him we see the character of Rasulullah. <laughs> and of course, many other things that could be said. Uh, you know, he made, you know, if you look at his life, he made 22 Hajj on foot. The man who had so much at his feet. If he'd asked, you know, those who loved him would have carried him. You know, but just his humility and his devotion to his Lord. You know, we see in him the true heir to Rasulullah. Sallallahu <laughs> Now coming back to Badr, as I said, you know, today's the 18th, yesterday of course was the 17th, tomorrow's the 19th, so tomorrow's the day that Sayyidina Ali, Karam Allah Wajh, is attacked in the masjid, in Fajr, and then the 21st will be the day that he passes from those wounds. But when we look at Badr, of course, again, this is the first year that fasting is an obligation. Uh, and this is pertinent to things that are happening in various places today. If we look at what triggered the battle of Badr itself, you know, and the synopsis of this is what? You know, Quraysh were sending caravans. Rasulullah Sussan was sending parties to stop those caravans. Because these were the caravans that they were going to use to weaponize themselves to come against the Muslims. And this is, you know, this was one of the big things that they were doing. And you know, there are people that say, well, you know, Rasulullah Sassam didn't, uh, wasn't involved in economic warfare. This is a form of economic war warfare. You know, because if the enemy doesn't have the means to arm himself, then how is he going to come against you? And this is what Rasulullah was doing. 
you know, the caravan. So he made it harder. And it was, you know, so now the caravans were having to go this way and that way, and they couldn't go a straight route to, to Syria, the <coughs> caravans that were going to Syria. So now it was costing them extra. So the profits from the caravans that were even getting through were less. The weapons that they were buying, you know, to, to come against the believers, well, a lot of those were getting plundered. I shouldn't use the word plundered, but taken away. Why? Because, you know, when, when these caravans were having to run, when they saw the Muslim uh, forces coming, and it wasn't large forces, but small groups coming, they would take off, and, you know, if you want to move quickly, you get rid of the heavy, heavy equipment. Armor and stuff is some of the first stuff to go. <coughs> so now you have this massive caravan, led by Abu Sufyan, who at this time is, you know, if you look at the hierarchy of Quraysh, you, know, you have the first tier of leaders like Abu Jahl, uh, Utbah, Shaiba, Umayyah bin Khalaf, you know, these guys. And then you have the second tier of leaders in which you see Abu Sufyan. After Badr, because all these first tiers were all killed in Badr, now you get a change. But Abu Sufyan's leading this massive caravan that basically was going to be the one that would get Quraysh ready for the war against the believers. The Rasulullah Sassam addresses his companions and he takes a group, 313 men, to go and stop this caravan. So the intention when they left, when the believers left Medina, they in their mind were thinking that we're going to go stop this caravan. When the caravan realized that the Muslims were on their tail, this is when Abu Sufyan sends word to Quraysh that, oh, you know, we've been overtaken and, and all of your wealth is, has been uh, taken away and so come and help. And this was a desperate plea because he knew if, if he sent word that, oh, we might be overtaken, then Quraysh would say, well, we might come. So now it's okay, you know, this has definitely happened and, and come and help us. But of course what happens? Abu Sufyan takes another route and evades the believers. But the army from Quraysh now comes. So the army would not have come then if Rasulullah Sussam had not set out from Medina. But when the decision was being made, Rasulullah Sussam didn't say, oh, it's Ramadan. You know, let's take it easy. We're not going to do anything. We'll wait till after Ramadan. When we look at Fatah Makkah, the conquest of Makkah, which occurred on the 20th of Ramadan, the same thing. Rasulullah could have easily postponed that. He said, oh, we'll wait till Ramadan is over and then we'll go deal with them. But what did he do? He said, we're going now. You know, so this concept that's crept into you know, a lot of us, that you know, we treat Ramadan or we treat Juma like the Jews treat Saturday, that you can't do anything. You know, you just, you know, that's all, you sit in the masjid and that's it. This concept is alien to Islam. So when the honor of Rasulullah Sallallahu is challenged, when the honor of Rasulullah Sallallahu is challenged by whoever so decides to, cha decides to challenge it, it doesn't matter whether it's Ramadan or outside of Ramadan whether it's Juma or any other day of the week. It is the obligation of the believers to stand up and defend that honor. And, you know, and the reason I'm saying this is that you know, there are right now what's going on in certain areas where certain people have demanded that so-called Muslim governments, you know, 
break off relations with France because of what it's been doing as far as ridiculing Rasulullah so challenging the honor of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi And they're doing this all in the middle of Ramadan. And so people are saying, oh, you know, they didn't, they couldn't have the decency to wait till after Ramadan. Which tells me that you don't have the decency to be a Muslim. Because somebody who claims to be Muslim, and yet hesitates in defending the honor of Rasulullah, his claim is a lie. You know, his name may be Muslim. His parents may be Muslim. But he is not. You know, when we look at the hypocrites throughout history, even during, and especially during the time of Rasulullah so, so. Every chance they got, what did they do? They challenged the honor of Rasulullah so, so, so. And what did the true believers do? Every chance they got, they upheld the honor of Rasulullah. <laughs> you know, part of having Iman, you know, when we say La ilaha illallah, that means what? That there's nothing, there's no deity, nothing worthy of being worshipped. Except who? Except Allah. But what does that mean? You know, it's not, oh, I simply make salat to Allah. I shouldn't fear anything. Because if I'm truly, if I truly believe this, and the, and the rest of the kalma, then that means I have befriended Allah. And Allah says about His true friends, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون that they don't have any fear. I don't put any fear on them, and nor do I give, put any grief on them. So if we're afraid of what somebody's going to do or what these so-called foreign powers are going to do. then the question is, do I really believe in Allah as the only deity? And of course, when I say Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is a pledge to my Lord that I will uphold the honor of Rasulullah Sallallahu in every aspect and at every time. And especially in Ramadan. And these are things that, inshallah, you know, we'll talk more about. Because there are other aspects of this and some of what I spoke about last week that's connected to this as well. You know, and, and truly directly connected to it. When we look at Shobi Abi Talib, you know, the three years where the Muslims were boycotted. And, and, you know, we think, oh, it's boycotting, you know, we think, oh, you know, uh, you know, they didn't have breakfast that morning. I mean, they were literally boycotted to where they had nothing. You know, they were eating leaves, dried leaves, and chewing on leather just to get that sensation of having something. All for what? All for the honor of Rasulullah. Yeah. 
And it's not like, okay, it was one day or two days or three days or three weeks or even three months. Three years. You know, most of us would have killed over, you know, after a week or two. And if we didn't, then we'd be saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, just, just take him. This is our attitude. Like, oh, you know, the protection of life uh, oh, supersedes everything. Which is true, but the protection of whose life? For the believer, the protection of whose life supersedes everything? The life of Rasulullah. <laughs> which is still here today. So if we ignore his honor, you know, because you know, there are people who say, oh, you know, if I'd just been at that time. You know, if we had been at that time, we would have been among the hypocrites. Or we would have been among the camp of Quraysh, the way our attitudes are. You know, Allah's mercy that we weren't at that time. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. You know, again, as I said, you know, I'm not talking about the obligations of fasting. You know, we all know the obligations of fasting. And those who don't can ask. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decorated Ramadan you know, with all of these lights for a reason that we look at them and we take lessons from them. Yeah. And then we apply them. It's not simply, oh, I know. Yeah. Even Abu Jahl knew you know, it's, it's applying it. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And may He fill our hearts with His true love and the true love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, His family, His companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. <coughs>